Hello everyone, uh, my name is Tom Harvey. Uh, I'm the manager of the GFY office, which is based out of FAO, but serves as an independent secretariat for all GFY partners. I'm gonna to present to you today R&D in the context of GFY. I'm gonna show how, I guess, GFY helps provide a, a structured pathway between the R&D community and the operational world of forest monitoring and emissions measurement, reporting and verification systems uh, in tropical countries. So as uh, many of you will probably already know, uh, GFOI is essentially just a voluntary partnership for coordinating the delivery of international support in forest monitoring and MRVs in tropical countries. Um, I guess you could say that GFOI is a lot of things uh, to a lot of people, um, but to distill this down into what I think are two practical points for the purpose of this workshop. It's important to note that GFY is one, uh, primarily seeking to facilitate coordination in the delivery of forest monitoring support to ensure that our community is operating in an efficient and, and effective manner. And that two, um, GFY is squarely focused on uh, addressing identified country needs for operationalizing or improving their forest monitoring and MRV capabilities. Um, I guess the second point is perhaps what all partners are fundamentally trying to achieve, but the key point here in the GFY context is this common understanding of these needs and how we as a community can collectively respond to these. So thinking about which partner is best placed or perhaps has the comparative advantage to help a country um, with a particular need. So um, how does this process look in practice for the R&D component of GFY? Um, I've done my best to draw this up as a, as a flow chart to demonstrate this, but I have to confess that uh, art class wasn't exactly my strongest skill set at school. So I apologize um, for how this may look. I realize there may be some uh, clashes of color palettes or, or the like, so please, Please bear with me and um, I hope this makes sense. So we start with country needs, as I've already said, um, and as with all things GFY. Um, so for R&D, this may mean, um, you know, there is an outstanding gap in knowledge or a weakness in an existing method or methodologies that needs attention or any other issue that is, I guess, commonly causing challenges or obstacles to progress that our current state of knowledge um, or our current state of consensus is unable to solve um, for them. So um, GFY has several different ways of, of, of identifying country needs. Um, we have been working on a, on a, a sort of systematic and centralized process for um, identifying these country needs or the CNAs, country needs assessment process. But these needs may also appear through technical reviews from submissions to the UNFCCC or other reporting forums, specific requests from countries, um, observations by, by experts working in our community, or I guess new requirements that, are, that um, I guess emerge with the evolution of, of different reporting forums. Um, I guess what's most important here though is that the need has been clearly identified and it is commonly accepted as a need. It's not just one individual's sort of point of view. It's it's not even just one country, it's, it's multiple countries. Um, and that that need is a, I guess, a tangible one uh, towards operationalizing or improving um, country systems. So the next one is um, obviously identifying what kind of R&D is needed to address those needs. Uh, many of you will be researchers, um, which I am not. So I certainly don't want to lecture you uh, about the research process. Um, but in the context of GFY, um, the R&D component has traditionally involved things like literature reviews and expert meetings, uh, and I guess other processes um, to try and, I guess, initially identify solutions um, that may already exist within our community or that can be, I guess, collated into a potential solution to the particular challenge. Um, and where the, you know, the, the body of experts working on this thinks that there is a solution, then this can be potentially um, put into a proposal to form um, new guidance. Um, but if we cannot easily find a solution, then new research or new science may need to be commissioned um, by partners, which they generally undertake um, themselves and hopefully 
uh, that can then help identify a solution to this challenge, which can then at a later date be brought back to the GFY community to be captured in some form of, of operational guidance. Uh, step three here, this is all about accessing operational readiness. So GFY is um, very much wanting to make sure that the resources that we take to countries um, is, is operational um, and the framework that we have developed to help us assess the maturity of um, new research and new products as they are developed is the CALM framework. So that stands for the Criteria for Consistently Assessing Levels of Maturity for Red Plus Concepts. And this is essentially a self-assessment tool that we ask researchers and developers to submit their own products to. Um, it provides actually quite a nice pathway for them to follow in progressing the development of their products. Um, and basically, if the product is deemed to be operationally ready, which is level six or above in the CALM framework, then it can go to the next step, which is a proposal to the MDD advisory group uh, for the development of a new MDD module um, on the topic to be hosted or included um, on the Red Compass platform. Um, so this next step is, is exactly that, the, the, the capturing of the guidance into a new module. Um, if the advisory group confirms that, um, that, the, that the research or the product uh, is responding to a priority country need and it is operationally ready and there are no other issues that they see with it, then they will generally approve um, this for development as, as a new MGD module. Um, and those modules are then generally developed uh, through in-kind contributions from partners. So generally the people um, proposing the module will be closely involved in, in the development of the module. Um, the advisory group may also recommend others, other authors or other experts who can be involved in the process to ensure that it fits within, um, I guess, the MGD structure. Um, and it's also important to note that uh, the MGD doesn't favour any particular method or approach. Um, it is open to any method that is operational and, and relevant to NFMS and MRV. Um, what the MGD does is it aims to provide a structured framework that allows countries to choose the approaches that best suit their own unique national circumstances. Um, so we're not picking winners. Uh, if there is an operational, if there are multiple um, methods for the same process, both are operational and relevant, then both can be included um, and countries can make the decisions themselves as to which, which process they want to choose. So just because you know, that, that there may be um, one new method developed and, and there are others already out there, that's fine. If it's also operational and relevant, it can be included along, alongside the other methods um, and the MGD and its um, online platform in, in, in Red Compass um, provide the framework to allow the countries to make that decision themselves. So then once the guidance uh, and or supporting resources are ready, um, they can then be disseminated to countries for use. So. GFY can um, help to, I guess, leverage the, I guess, the resources and the programs of GFY's capacity building partners. So they can take these resources um, in their trainings or other forms of support uh, to countries, um, either through the Red Compass platform or individually as standalone modules. Um, it can also be promoted through GFY's communications channels, which is um, growing ever, ever stronger and more effective by the day. And also many countries um, access Red Compass and the MGD resources themselves directly from the platform. So um, it is quite a, I guess, a powerful dissemination um, platform that we've been able to establish both uh, within GFY and, and, and within GFY centrally and across our partners. And then finally, of course, um, the partners then use that uh, um, these new resources uh, into their broader national forest monitoring systems and MRV procedures um, to generate credible information, which they then go on to use to inform their national decision making and action, uh, international reporting, and any other purposes that they see fit. So, this here on the screen now, I guess, is is the pathway right through from the identification of the need for for more research through to the undertaking of the research, its progression from operational level, development into MGD. Uh, operationally ready guidance dissemination through the GFY, um, uh, I guess, network of capacity building partners and GFY communications, tropical countries then, then using it. I should stress um, that this is how things are supposed to work. 
but for various understandable reasons, this isn't always the case. Um, but I think what is important that is that the GFY community strives as best we can to align with with this process um, wherever possible. And we're not where we're clearly able to explain why this isn't the case. So I hope that is clear um, and it makes sense. And you can see how GFY provides that systematic framework for addressing uh, country needs for new and improved knowledge um, and for also helping researchers to progress their work to an operational phase and to ultimately being uh, picked up uh, for, use, for use by countries uh, within, within operational environments. So I think we'll be um, familiar um, with the resources I've listed, but here are the links here to show you where they, where they can be um, accessed. So leave it at that. Thank you all very much. Looking forward to the discussion. Hello, today I'm going to talk to you about the CALM assessment, which is criteria for consistently assessing levels of maturity of Red Plus concepts. I'm going to talk about this in the context of GFOI and also in the context of how it's been used in the Red Copernicus project so far. And then I'll look at the next steps for how it can be used in the future. Background information on CALM. CALM was developed by GFOI. You can find some more information on CALM uh, using this link. Um, and then it was re revised for use in the Red Copernicus project. And a questionnaire was developed in order to capture the information required to do a full maturity assessment. So providing some additional information ab above and beyond what CALM is providing. Um, but one of the questions was the, the CALM rating itself. And um, so then my question um, that I'm posing is what is next for CALM? Firstly, for those who don't know, CALM is um, a, a way of assessing the maturity of a particular technology and CALM is based upon the application readiness levels and technology readiness level, levels, which were initially developed by NASA. Um, and it has three levels of maturity. So research um, and within that, three more levels than pre-operational and operational. So here's the CALM framework with the nine levels. There are some milestones which state some thresholds which need to be met in order to reach each level and then the supporting information which is needed to demonstrate that the milestone has been met and this has been developed with Red Plus concepts in mind. So some of these um, things that are listed in the milestone and the supporting information are really very much related to red plus concepts which doesn't really fit all forest monitoring concepts so calm was updated for use in red copernicus with this issue in an additional um, column was added called all supporting information which relates to any information which describes a capacity which isn't specifically used in the Red Plus context, but is used for forest monitoring. Um, so in the first three levels, actually nothing has changed. But as you can see in the next levels, um, some information has been added in this all supporting information uh, column, which can relate to things which aren't Red MRV related. And some more examples here in the operational levels. So within the Red Copernicus project, we developed a questionnaire to gather information on capacities for forest monitoring. And uh, this questionnaire included the CALM rating as one of the questions, but also other information on the maturity and development of the concept. Um, it was based on the GFOI registry of tools. So actually the questionnaire could be used to provide information in the registry um, if needed. The survey can be found in the link shown on the screen and how it was implemented was that experts, preferably the developer of the concept itself, was asked to fill in the survey uh, because they were able to provide all the information which was required and it's quite an in-depth survey with lots of questions. So easier if the person who's filling it in knows the concept very well. And I kept mentioning concepts when I was talking about CALM and that's because it can be used to rate um, a number of different 
concepts, including methods, tools, data sets, products, and platforms. And we use these um, three categories in the questionnaire, and depending on which of the categories it was, different questions pop up that are relevant for each of these three categories. And the questionnaire is quite broad. It has questions about the developer, um, questions which describe the concept, and then finally questions which assess the maturity aspect of the concept. And this includes input data, so the coverage and access of that data, pre-processing of those data, analysis elements, including operationality and distribution, and then the country uptake. And um, finally, any R&D needs uh, are included in the questionnaire as well. So uh, my final questions are really about how to use CALM systematically within GFOI. Do we need to do any updates? Are these updates that we did for um, Red Copernicus helpful? Um, how it um, relates to other GFOI initiatives, for example, the Red Registry of Tools or OpenMLV, um, and then how we use CALM to communicate with stakeholders um, and do we want to perhaps even populate a database of operational and research concepts and how would we present this information clearly uh, to stakeholders. So um, I think there's plenty of dis stuff to discuss. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Eli Penever reed and I work at the World Bank Group as a Carbon Science Coordinator. I'm very excited to talk to you today about the newly developed centralized knowledge management platform, OpenMRV. OpenMRV has been developed by the World Bank as a contribution to the Global Forest Observations Initiative, GEO4Y. The platform will be hosted by FAO and managed by GEO4Y. My talk will emphasize its importance to the MRV research and development community. And in order to do this in the most concise way, I would like to draw your attention to four key elements, which will provide clarity on why such platform is needed. First, I will focus on the issues the MRV users are currently facing in order to understand what type of a solution we're looking for. And once such solution has been identified, what are the expected results and who would be the main beneficiaries to such results? The last element of my talk will outline the actions that need to be taken by the research and development community. Even though there might be other issues, we have identified two main ones. First, the fact that there is a little detailed guidance and training resources for implementing MRV processes and using tools. And second, the fact that there isn't one virtual place for practitioners and countries to access all available MRV support resources. Because of these issues, the countries end up relying on external support through capacity building activities, which by itself is dependent on funding that is not always guaranteed. The lack of one-stop shop hinders the desired South-South exchange among countries where they can share the gain knowledge and experience in a systematic way. The identified issues have led to the development of OpenMRV. OpenMRV will become the newest addition to the GeoFOI family of MRV support platforms, such as those already known to most of you, Red Compass, and the one soon to be released, Registry of Tools. The Methods and Guidance document provides links between the IPCC guidance and the Red Plus activities and guidance for the selection of different methodological options. Later, the MGD was made available to countries through the Red Compass platform, providing interactive access to MGD and various resources to enable countries to assess 
the level of operation and identify gaps. GeoFOI identified, though, that there was a missing link between existing tools and the MGD guidance, so countries weren't able to decide which tool to use once a policy and design decision was taken and how to implement them once selected. Thus, the role of OpenMRV is to guide countries through the detailed steps of implementing tools and methods for forest MRV processes without relying on external support. OpenMRV will also support exchange of knowledge and expertise among the users, as countries have explicitly identified such platform is currently missing. OpenMRV will be launched via a GeoFOI webinar on 22nd of June this year. The main beneficiaries of OpenMRV will be the countries involved in MRV of forest-based carbon emissions. Within OpenMRV, we have organized all available MRV support resources in a tailored fashion through three use case scenarios thus enabling a wide range of users, regardless of the level of their technical expertise and experience. OpenMRV will also host learning paths to make it easier for the user to learn new skills and gain knowledge in smaller increments. The last key element is focus on the actions needed to maintain and enhance the functionalities and ease of use of the plethora of MRV support resources hosted and those to be hosted on the OpenMRV platform. Here we have outlined four main action items. One, the research and development community should consider that their research will be eventually used in an operational setting, so they must meet a specific need. Two, Develop tools, even if in a pilot stage, should be made publicly available and open to foster testing by countries and enable further improvements. Three, training and dissemination materials should come hand in hand with the development of research and tools. And four, recommendation is that these training and dissemination materials are prepared in markup language and made publicly available in OpenMRV. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Africa Flores from NASA Servir Science Coordination Office, and today I'm going to talk about the different activities that Servir has that are related to tropical forest monitoring. As quick background, SERPIR is a joint initiative between NASA and USAID. We are currently active in five regions. In each of these regions, we partner with centers of excellence, which are the ones who represent SERPIR. We work in different thematic areas that include agriculture, land cover, land use change and ecosystems, water and water related disasters, and climate. The services or the activities that I will present about today are part of our land cover, land use change and ecosystem thematic area. We have a large portfolio in our land cover, land use change and ecosystems thematic area. Uh, all the hubs have activities or services in each of uh, in this thematic area. And uh, at high level, we can organize all those services in these key areas. I will highlight some key services that are related to tropical forest monitoring, such as the illegal gold mining service in Servir Amazonia. We also have a similar service in West Africa that is monitoring illegal gold mining as well. For Servir Amazonia, we are focusing in the Madre de Dios area that has been suffering from illegal gold mining for a long time, and you may be very uh, well aware. Uh, it's a big issue in the region, and it's also a source of human trafficking among the very negative impacts that this activity has, such as deforestation. Uh, for this service, Servir Amazonia is using Sentinel-1C band data and, and using a change detection algorithm. Those alerts 
are being validated uh, using planet high resolution data that is acquired through the NICV agreement. This service is being developed by Servira Amazonia Consortium partner ACA and SIG, and uh, is being done in co-development with the government of Peru, who have a program called Mercury 19 that this system is going to be providing information to. Then we have these other two examples that are monitoring deforestation and forest degradation in the Amazon. One led by Stephanie Esfera from Richmond University, part of our applied sciences team. She is monitoring deforestation and forest degradation and evaluating its impact on ecosystem services. She is evaluating multiple land cover change algorithms to map deforestation and forest degradation and is also using high resolution data to train and validate uh, these results. We also have uh, Nayara Pinto from JPL, also part of our applied sciences team, that is monitoring crop expansion, specifically cacao and oil palm plantations over native forest ecosystems. And this is to provide information on zero deforestation commodity supply chains. And uh, Nayara is using SAR data to map oil palm and cacao plantations. Then in Africa, we have a number of land cover monitoring services. And for this, I would just like to highlight that the main purpose of these land cover services is to support countries to provide their reporting requirements under UNFCCC. And we have several examples in which government, uh, governments have been using these land cover maps in their greenhouse emissions inventories. Then for the Hindu Kush Himalaya and Lower Mekong, we have the regional land cover monitoring system, which started in Lower Mekong and now has been expanded to the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. Um, this system is using optical data, Landsat, to create annual maps that are based on a primitive approach in which biophysical parameters are created. And then depending upon of the need or application of a particular map, uh, the specific land cover classes on la or land use are created to fulfill that need. For all of our land cover services, we are using high resolution data, particularly for the calibration of the algorithm and validation of results. And we are also starting to ingest synthetic aperture radar C band. Now, uh, we also work with the SAR handbook. Uh, this was an uh, initiative between Servir and Silva Carbon, which main intention was to enhance the capacity of the Servir Global Network to use SAR for forest monitoring and biomass estimation. It has been a great success. Uh, now the Servir Global Network is starting to use a synthetic aperture radar in the multiple services, uh, and I just mentioned a few of them. Uh, but at the same time, the whole community has embraced uh, this uh, book, this our handbook, and the uh, tutorials that uh, were created as part of this. Uh, we have had more than 600,000 accesses worldwide since its release. As a follow-up to the SAR handbook, uh, we have been working on forest stand height. Uh, derived from L-band and LIDAR observations. And my colleague uh, Helen Paraji has been following up on this and uh, automating the algorithms that were uh, discussed or provided through the SAR handbook in, on chapter four. Uh, now uh, they are available uh, for the whole community and we are actually updating uh, our tutorial for that particular section uh, to facilitate these uh, scripts. Regarding future work, Servir is starting two initiatives. One of them is the Servir Carbon Monitoring System, which uh, will leverage the Servir Network's expertise in land cover monitoring to evaluate changes in greenhouse emissions at national and regional levels. This work is in development and is just starting, it is being led by my colleague Emil Sherrington. The other initiative is the intercomparison analysis of multiple land cover change algorithms. And uh, here we are also leveraging the power of the Servir Global Network, and we are going to assess all of these uh, algorithms in each of the regions where Servir works and uh, uh, create information regarding trade-offs about using a given land cover uh, method. 
Regarding opportunities and barriers, um, we see a lot of opportunities in the new satellite observations that are going to become available, particularly NISAR that is going to be providing L-band. Having been used a C band, we see some of the limitations in trying to use C band to monitor deforestation in tropical uh, areas. And there is a lot of opportunities as, uh, as soon as L band becomes available. Uh, regarding the high resolution data, we are already using it uh, for calibration and validation of results. I think that we are going to be using it even more as an input, as a direct input for our uh, land cover analysis. Regarding barriers, I think that we still need an operational solution to have uh, RTC products for SAR uh, C1, uh, C band uh, data. And uh, for cloud computer, we see it as an opportunity and a barrier because uh, it's definitely the way to go given all the data sets and the multiple missions that are collecting satellite data right now. Um, and we are working with time series at the moment, so cloud computing is the solution, is the way to go. However, there is still a component of trust and uh, expertise uh, for governments to rely on this particular solution and buy in into it. Um, that's just a very high level, and uh, in case you have any question, please feel free to email us or contact us. This is my email and the one from my colleague, Emil Charrington. Thank you. Good afternoon. In this short presentation, I would like to introduce a new initiative called GeoTrees. GeoTrees stands for Forest Biomass Reference System from Tree by Tree Inventory Data and is a community activity under the GEO umbrella. My name is Klaus Cipoll. I work for the European Space Agency and I'm the contact person for this activity. The goal of GeoTrees is to establish a network of biomass reference sites that can support the validation of global Earth observation based biomass data sets. To this end, tree by tree inventory data should be complemented with airborne laser scanning data sets to support the upscaling of the plot based estimates to regional scales. In addition, for selected plots, uh, we plan to collect terrestrial and UAV based LIDAR scans. It can be used um, to support an in depth analysis, but also uh, to evolve these emerging technologies. But why do we need such data? There's an urgent need for validation data because we see a large number of biomass maps emerging from Earth observation projects. These data are used for research, but also in the context of international agreements and hence should be thoroughly validated. In fact, CEOs recently published the Biomass Validation Protocol that was supported by a large community of ecologists and Earth observation experts. This protocol includes a number of best practice recommendations. I just want to pick out three recommendations that I think are key uh, for the discussion. So first, Earth observation products require independent and traceable validation. So validation against the gold standard. Second, Earth observation product validation requires large forest plots that are comparable in size to the Earth observation products. And they should be complemented by airborne and terrestrial and UV LIDAR to allow scaling up of these uh, sparse data points. And finally, all the data should be free and open, um, accessible to the whole community. Unfortunately, we lack the data to implement this protocol. And here GeoTrees com comes into play. GeoTrees should respond to this need by establishing a global uh, set of forest biomass observation sites that can be used as a reference system. As a goal, we defined 100 core sites that should meet the requirements set out in the CEOS protocol. So for these sites, we will collect in situ tree by tree data and complement it by airborne and terrestrial or UAV LIDAR scans. And in addition, there will be 210 opportunity sites that should fill gaps between these core sites. To finance this activity, the idea is to implement a shared cost model. We rec recognize that no single party can pay for this infrastructure. So everyone is asked to take a fair share in the financing of this system. 
Another important principle is that this is really a bottom-up initiative and that we build on existing projects. Here I just um, show two of the major projects collecting tree by tree level data in the tropics. One is forest plots uh, led by a European team. The other one is forest geo and, and US based initiative. And these teams, they do really an, an excellent job working together with local teams, providing training to these teams, curating the data that is collected and making sure the data is shared and quality controlled. The challenge now is that we need funding for these networks and that we complement this data with LIDAR-based observations. One of the core principles of this activity is that all the data shall be open and shared with the community. To this end, we have set up the forest observation system where you can already today access a large number of forest plot data. This brings me to the end of the GeoTrees presentation. Maybe as a take-home message, let me briefly summarize what GeoTree stands for. GeoTrees is a bottom-up collaborative community activity to collect tree by tree level data together with LIDAR observation that is suitable for validation of Earth observation products. This data is urgently needed to trust what we measure with satellites. And here we should not take for granted that such data is available for free, even if you can download or access this on, on some websites. Someone needs to pay for this data and we as an Earth observation community have to take responsibility. We have to foster our collaboration with the ecological community who are collecting this data at large and we have to take a fair share in financing uh, all this work. With this I would like to thank you for your attention and if you have any questions please um, get in touch with me and drop me an email and I'm happy to respond to you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah Goking, and I am a co-manager of the data component within GFOI. My pitch represents a call for you to provide feedback on gaps in the area of integrating ground observations with remote sensing data. As mentioned in other presentations, GFOI has four interrelated components. The Methods and Guidance Documentation, or MGD component, develops and serves best practices guidance on forest monitoring. The capacity building component works directly with countries to build in-country forest monitoring capacity. The R&D component, of course, identifies and addresses new areas of research. The data coordination component includes not only remote sensing or earth observation data, but also ground observations, such as those collected for national forest inventories or more intensive site specific studies. And of course, there's some overlap among these four components and the topic of my pitch, integration of ground data with remote sensing, is one that definitely crosses all four components. So what do I mean by ground data? Ground data include any data not collected using remote sensors. In some cases, it may include photo interpreted data such as point observations using high resolution aerial imagery where that photo interpreted data serves as ground data in conjunction with coarser resolution satellite data. Examples of ground data include data collected by national or subnational forest inventories, data on land use, management, disturbance history, or soil type. So these are often maps uh, and may involve some field sampling. Ground data also includes data from intensive research plots, such as growth and yield studies, tree biomass modeling studies, and then also it includes field observations that can be converted to emissions and removal factors. So what have we done so far regarding ground data? In 2019, GFOI's data component began a review of existing guidance on the integration of ground data with remote sensing. We identified several gaps, which we somewhat addressed in the new version of the Methods and Guidance Documentation, or MGD 3.0. Some of those gaps included definitions of ground data uses, such as, as reference data or auxiliary data for stock change and gain loss approaches. 
Um, we also address gaps in estimating area, area change, change in carbon pools, and the uncertainties associated with these estimates. MGD 3.0 also includes statistical considerations and approaches for combining ground data with remote sensing data to estimate carbon stocks, emissions, and removals, as well as their variances. Now that the MGD 3.0 is available, we're returning to the ground data review with the purpose of identifying any gaps that remain or are likely to arise in the near future. Some gaps may be able to be filled by developing additional guidance or capacity building materials, but others may require additional research and development for new techniques, which may be conducted by GFOI or by GFOI's partners. Examples of existing gaps might include combining model-based, model-assisted, and or design-based estimation. For example, if a country or region is using ground data collected by a national forest inventory, but they also have a large area of non-response where the national forest inventory could not be conducted and plots could not be measured, then how can they use model-based estimation to fill in the non-response gap? So that's one example that might um, be something we would address. Another example might be how to select appropriate data and estimation methods when using ground data in combination with hierarchical data sets, such as remote sensing data at multiple resolutions or for multiple sensor types. So to close this pitch, it's really a request for input for your ideas on where gaps exist or where gaps may be expected to arise in the near future in regards to integrating ground data with remote sensing. You can send your input directly to me, or if you're already connected with someone else in GFOI, please pass it along to them. Thank you for your kind attention to my pitch. Enjoy the rest of the meeting.